Good morning, Generations. It's good to see you guys. October 4th. We made it to October. We made it. We're here. Halloween is around the corner, or some form of Halloween anyway. And then before you know it, we'll uh, be celebrating again with Christmas. And, and man, aren't we all glad that 2020 is just almost done, right? We're so close. So it's good to see you guys again. Let's, uh, let's think about more important things like worship and learning about God today. And, and so if you would, let's uh, pray together. And Father God, we thank you for this time digitally and uh, those who can gather with us here. And, and we just ask that right now that you would be with our hearts and minds as we sing out our praises, as, as we uh, share in each other's uh, mournful times as well. And we just pray right now that you're, you would be with us and that your spirit would be on us as our hearts are open to what you have uh, for us to hear. It's your name that we do pray. Amen. So, some of you guys are stuck at home with those kids. It is Energy and Sunday today. Um, if you couldn't make it, I'm so sorry, but I did want to bring at least one fun song for the kids at home. So this is for you kids, for you kids that are, you know, three, four, and maybe 54, and maybe 84. All right. So we're going to sing a song. It's really weird. I, I feel like if I'm not careful, we keep doing more of these recordings. I'm going to end up in like the 1800s. I just kind of keep going back and back and back. Um, we're going to the 1994s this time, if you can remember that far back. So with a little fun song I like to call The Happy Song. Oh, I could sing unending songs of how you saved my soul. Well, I could dance a thousand miles because of your great love. Oh, I could sing Unending songs of how you save my soul. Well, I could dance a thousand miles because of your great love. My heart is blessed, Lord, to tell of all you've done, of how you changed my life and wiped away the past. I want to shout it out from every rooftop scene. For now I know that God is for me, not against me. I could sing unending songs of how you saved my soul. Well, I could dance a thousand miles because of your great love. My heart is busting, Lord, to tell of all you've done, of how you changed my life and wiped away the past. I want to shout it out from every rooftop scene. For now I know that God is for me, not against me. I could sing an ending song of how you saved my soul. Well, I could dance a thousand miles because of your great love. Yeah, and everybody's singing now because we're so happy. Everybody's dancing now Because we're so happy If only we could see your face See you smiling over us Unseen angels celebrate For joy is in this place One more time Oh, I could see and ending songs of how you saved my soul. Well, I could dance a thousand miles because of your great love. Oh, I could sing an ending songs of how you saved my soul. Well, I could dance a thousand miles because of your great love. Woo. Hope you guys got to dance a little bit at home, you know, and if you didn't, rewind that and dance for me, okay? All right. And all who are thirsty all who are we 
just come to the fountain Dip your heart in the stream of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out too deep We sing, come Lord Jesus, come Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. And all who are thirsty, and all who are weak, just come to the fountain. Dip your heart in the stream of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of His mercy. His deep cries out too deep. We sing, come Lord Jesus, come. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. Oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. Oh, come, Lord Jesus. like thine can peace afford I need thee oh I need thee every hour I need thee oh bless me now my Savior I come to thee and I need Every hour, stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. And I need Thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me Thine indeed, Thy blessed Son. And I need thee, 
oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. And I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to Thee. I've been feeling a lot of that this week. I need Thee. I need Thee. Well, all y'all watching are actually getting extra because this is not what I'm doing on Energen for those of you in person. <laughs> Can focus a little bit more on the adults. So this week we had our first presidential debate. And if we've learned anything about American politics, it's that every single thing you say and every single thing you do can and will be used against you if you run for office. That comment at WKYT you made 10 years ago, oh, we are so bringing that up. You said, I've got a screenshot. Let me ask you a question. How would you like to live your entire life in front of a camera or in front of a live studio audience with every single side comment? Oh, man, she's gained weight. Every single thing that you do behind closed doors, every burst of anger recorded and remembered. Sound good? <laughs> no way, right? Some of you might say to me, Max, come on, recorded and remembered? I'm married. That's what I live every day of my life. No, 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 no. Here's the thing. Few of us, few of us live up to the kind of people that we want to be. Consistency is something we all struggle with, and yet it matters. Consistency matters. There's a word for it. It's called integrity. The virtue definition that we tell our kids at Generations is that integrity is choosing to be truthful in whatever you say and do. But really, it's a little bit more than that. It's a quality, the quality of being honest, of being morally upright, of having a strong set of moral principles. If you want to stay married, if you want to keep your friends, if you want to advance in your job, if you want to be respected, you've got to have integrity. Integrity matters. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 17, we're told, I know, my God, I know that you examine our hearts and rejoice when you find integrity there. You want to please God? You do it with integrity. God is pleased with integrity. You want to put a smile on God's face? Live your life with integrity. Today, I want to peer into the lives of three young men who were probably no more than 14 years old. And their story is recorded in the book of Daniel. And all of this stuff in Daniel chapter 1 takes place roughly around 605 B.C. That's before Christ. You'll find Daniel in the Old Testament. He's after the book of Psalms, after Isaiah, after Ezekiel. If you really have trouble finding it, I find it helpful to go to the Holy Table of Contents, which is on the first few pages, and you can find Daniel chapter 1 there. Daniel and his friends actually came from very rich and powerful families in the country of Judea. Um, they were what we would have called noble families, but we know them today as the rich and powerful. If your last name is Gates or Trump or Clinton, you can open doors because of your last name. And so these young men actually would have had, uh, their families would have had very large landed estates out in the country, Judean countryside with uh, large crops, large sets of animals, servants, all kinds of people that were part of the household. But they also would have had apartments in Jerusalem where the young sons could stay 
while the king of Judah was holding court and having celebrations and big dinners and banquets. Most of all, Daniel and his friends had uh, potential. They were invited to the king's court. They were given the right kind of schooling for Judean boys, and they all had a bright future. That is, until a man named Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came through the region, and he laid waste to everything. Only this time, when he came to the city of Jerusalem and laid siege to it, the king of Judah capitulated. He just said, Uncle, <laughs> I surrender, without a fight. That's where we come to things in Daniel chapter 1. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they're well-versed in every branch of learning and are gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve in the royal palace. Train these young men, train these young men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens, and they were trained to be, they were to be trained for three years and then would enter his royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. So Daniel is taken from his family in the Judean countryside, and he's hauled 500 miles away to Babylon, to the capital city, and forced to become an advisor to the very king who robbed him of his bright future. Now, the chief of staff, this man named Ashpenaz, did something to make sure that Daniel and his friends would know that it was Nebuchadnezzar who controlled his life and controlled his future. And that's when Ashpenaz changed their names. Verse 7, the chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. Abednego, yep. So they're all given these new names. Daniel, which means my judge is God, becomes Belshazzar, which means May Bel protect his life, Bel being one of the gods of Babylon. Hananiah, which means Yahweh has been gracious. And we just saw a, a Bible project video about how that's a chief characteristic of God. That's his name, Hananiah. It's changed to Shadrach, which means at the command of Aku. Try that the next time your car door doesn't work right or whatnot. At the command of Aku. Yeah, no, don't do that. Aku was the moon god of Babylon and so on. So these guys are renamed. Back then, your name actually meant something really important. It was meant to kind of encapsulate who you were. So Daniel and his friends are renamed, but they don't say anything. They remain silent. Now, Ashpenaz also enrolled the three of them in this program, this program of study that lasted three years that included cuneiform, Aramaic, mathematics, let me say that again for some of you in middle school and high school. Mathematics, 605 BC, they're learning mathematics, okay? And then astrology, or what they called the art of divination. These young men were taught how to predict the future by observing the movement of the stars, the flight patterns of birds, and yes, goat entrails and sheep livers. <laughs> but Daniel and his friends remain silent. That is, until we hit verse 8. Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. Daniel believed that eating meat and wine that was offered in sacrifice to the Babylonian gods would render him unclean. 
he believed that it would violate his conscience because at the end of the day, what he would be saying is that, yes, Nebuchadnezzar controls my life and my future and my hope is in Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel didn't want to do that. For him, it was a firm line of integrity. Now, you and I would look at it because we don't have the kind of rules and laws that these young men had been schooled in. And food is food, right? I mean, the only time we worry about it as Americans is if somebody's cajoling us because we've had a second helping of dessert or something has too much fat content. They're the food police or the food Nazis. But for Daniel, this was every bit as wrong as stealing from a bank. This was a matter of conscience. So Daniel does something interesting, and that's the second part of verse 8 and following. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. So Daniel goes to the chief of staff and asks permission first. And when that doesn't work, Daniel proposes a 10-day experiment. Now, God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel, but he responded, I'm afraid of my Lord, the king, who has ordered you to eat this food and wine. And if you become pale and thin compared to the other youths, I am afraid the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke with the, the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after him, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water. At the end of 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and te tested them for 10 days. And then verse 15. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. After the 10 day experiment, it's obvious that Daniel's firm line in the sand, that issue of integrity for him was worth holding. Because at the end of the 10 days, it's the, the message that Daniel wants to see getting clear is, is out for him and his friends and this attendant. They looked healthier. It's not Nebuchadnezzar that's making them excel. It's God who's making them excel. God is actually the one in control. God is actually the one at work. And, and the author is wanting us to see this. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 2, we're told that God is the one that handed over Judah to the Babylonians. In verse 9, we're told it's that God gave Daniel favor with Ashpenaz. And then in verse 17, we're told that God is the one who gave those three, those four young men extraordinary skills and abilities. Let me ask a simple question. What if Daniel after he had been transported 500 miles away, decided, you know what? I'm out of Judah. All bets are off. If he wants me to eat that food, I'll eat that food. Whatever he wants, because Nebuchadnezzar controls my life and my future. What if Daniel had believed that and didn't want to have integrity over the things that mattered? Let me ask you a simple question. Where's the line in the sand for you? What are the things that, that, that those lines that you won't cross, the things that you won't do, the things that you know would violate your conscience or disappoint your heavenly father? I always try to keep things practical here. So how can you and I, how can you and I show integrity? What does it mean to show integrity in your life? And I want to give you three suggestions today. First and foremost, tell the truth even when it hurts. Tell the truth, even when it hurts. One of my favorite stories of World War II London involves a pastor who recounts this incident in a day in his life. So this pastor serving Britons during the Blitz during World War II needed to go downtown. So he got on the trolley, he paid his fare, he sat down, the conductor, gave him too much change back. Well, things were tight. There was rationing. Money was tight. 
and he didn't have money for a lunch he was supposed to attend later that week. And the change he got back, the extra change was enough for that lunch. And so in the seat, he's wrestling. He's like, God, is this your, is this your provision? Like I, I'm given the wrong change. And he, he just, but he kept coming back to the fact that that would be dishonest. So he got up out of his seat and before his stop came, before they reached downtown, he got to the conductor and he said, look, you've given me the wrong amount. You've made a mistake. You gave me too much change. Well, the conductor smiled at him and he goes, no, sir, this was no mistake. You see, I was in your church on Sunday and I just wanted to see what kind of man you were. Oh, right. Tell the truth, even when it hurts. Number two, keep a promise even when you would rather not. If you say you're going to do something, do it. So that means that you got to, so how can we do this, right? We Americans are really bad about over-promising, okay? So watch what you say. Watch what you say. Yes, make fewer promises. And when you do promise something, make it count. If you can't, don't say that you can. If you don't know, say, I don't know. Can you, Max? Can you, will you, what I don't know. It's okay to say, I don't know. And you know what else is okay? No, I'm sorry, I can't. Better to say you can't and surprise someone when you can than to promise you can and then disappoint them when you can't. You know what I'm saying? Keep a promise even when you'd rather not. And last but not least, one of the huge ways we keep our integrity is by admitting mistakes and faults freely. Saying regularly, and you're going to have to because this is why pencils have erasers. My bad. Oops. You know what? That was my error. That's my mistake. I did that. I'm so sorry. People will respect an honest, my bad, my mistake. What they won't respect is when you're trying to gloss over or pretend those don't, things don't happen. Look, integrity just like we see in the life of Daniel and his friends, is rooted in this inner life. It's who we are and what we do when no one is watching. Daniel and his friends knew about the experiment. The attendant and Ashpenaz knew, knew about the experiment, but Nebuchadnezzar did not. There was a day when Nebuchadnezzar got in front of everybody and bragged on these Judeans. Oh, how they've benefited from me. We took these poor blokes out of... Judah, and we've brought them to the promised land of Babylon, and we've given them an education. Look how fine they are, and look who's responsible. Me, King Nebuchadnezzar. But Daniel knew, and his friends knew. Why is this important? You never know when integrity is going to actually have your back. One of my favorite stories as a pastor involves a builder and a self-made millionaire from Texas. So there's this self-made millionaire. He has lots of projects, lots of, lots of fires going. He has rental properties. Uh, he's got several businesses. He's got several things he's trying to start. And he knows a builder in the Houston area who has uh, built and renovated some of his rental properties and has been a good person to have in his deck, his portfolio of people along the years. Well, one of the downturns hit greater Houston and the, the builder's uh, projects just dry up. There's nothing to build. There's nothing going on. And he's kind of short on cash. Cash. So the self-made millionaire calls him one day and says, look, I got, I, the wife and I have been talking and here's the deal. I think we're ready to downsize. I want you to build me a house. You got $300,000 to do it. And <clears throat> let me know when the project's done. So they agree on some basic parameters for the house and the builder gets going. Well, when he starts the project, he realizes, wow, $300,000. And again, this is a few years ago, $300,000, you know, I don't, I don't, I could, I could water down the concrete a little for the footers. I could, you know, I could use the wood that I don't normally use for the studs and stuff and, and the rafters. And he, and he just, he, he cut corners. Now, when the drywall went up, when, when the granite countertops and all that kind of stuff went in, it was all, you know, looked great, but he cut corners here and there. And so that $300,000 house at the end of the project, he had a $100,000 profit that he was going to walk away with. And he was so, ex so excited. And, and he, so the, 
the, the self-made millionaire calls, hey, you know, is it ready? Yes, it's ready. And so they get together and the self-made millionaire says this to the builder. You know what? I know things, times have been hard right these days and I know you've, you've not had any projects. And so I just wanted to do something to thank you. I want you to keep the keys. This is actually your house. I did this for you. Oh, right? Gang, integrity matters. It matters for you. It matters for the people around you. And it matters because God is counting on us to be men and women of integrity. Gang, I love you guys. I hope to see many of you here for Energen. And in the meantime, be integrity people. Be it, live it. The people out there are counting on it, okay? It makes a difference.